OK. So hello, I think we will wait a little bit for people to join, uh, to join the session. But at least we can have a quick uh, check if everything uh, works. Meanwhile, how are you, Filippo, today? Well, I'm absolutely more than fine. Thank you. How about you? Good, good. Thank you. I mean, I'm still uh, trying to recover from uh, this uh, particular situation, but uh, I think it's going pretty good. Which situation? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which situation? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, this is the, the perfect approach, I think, for especially when we think of the new normal, uh, is normal, right? Yeah, yeah, the new, new normal is that the entire story didn't happen. That's the, that's the attitude, otherwise we're going to get mad. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let me see if I can, uh, okay, I got the, also the webinar chat set up. Let me see if everything works on uh, Facebook, and I think it does. Good. Okay. So we will wait one more minute and then we will start. Meanwhile, I can ask you something actually. Your book, how is it going? Did you get the. Uh, yeah, we had, we had, I think, 1,000 downloads in just a few days. Wow. So, so, yeah, that was very good. I mean, considering that it's such a specific topic, uh, yes, we are very pleased of the results, I have to say. And, of course, as you can imagine, it was a huge effort for the team to put up all the strategy in just uh, just few days. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And do you plan to do a second uh, uh, edition? We have a second edition in September. Uh, well, September, I guess, because what, what we really want to, to do now is also to encapsulate, for example, information on the sort of indoor air quality. Now, at the end of the game, this is very much what we needed to understand uh, and what we gather some information and what is really relevant for the people that are working in indoor like ourselves. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I think uh, we are, actually we will dig into this uh, during our conversation. So um, I will try to stick to the time because I know that uh, you are a very, very busy uh, professor, so we don't want to like to take all of your afternoon but um, so let's let me just introduce uh, uh, what this session is about uh, first of all it's part of a project from Sansta that is called healthy thinking project and within this uh, project we decided to have uh, Sansta conversations with professionals like yourself and uh, uh, so for today for the audience that is joining um, we have professor Filippo Graziani who is the professor of periodontology University of Pisa, and is also the past president of the European Federation of Periodontology. So thanks so much, Filippo, for joining us today. It's really an honor for us to have you. And uh, I think the best uh, to start is to speak a little bit about all of the different documents that either you created directly or you actually support the creation around COVID and uh, I will also say our results somehow. Well, uh, well, thank you, first of all, Marcia, and thank you, Sanstas, for, for helping us to give a, a echo to all the knowledge that uh, we, as we being the scientific community, built in such a short span of time. I mean, really what we've seen is something unprecedented. Uh, in, 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 the, in, in, in just two or three months, the amount of knowledge that was built was incredible. And we have to really to, to bear in mind that we came from, from nothing. You know, we had no idea what we were talking about. So we had really to build up a sort of a knowledge that also had some very important translational uh, effectiveness. Really, not just to get to understand, but what to do next and what to do in our daily practice. And I'm not sure we know, but I'm surely we know much more than two or three months ago. <laughs> yeah. So what... what, what that was a very peculiar story because since the beginning we, we tried to, I mean, our group to try to understand how dentistry could be performed because in fact dentistry never really stopped. At the end of the game, uh, I, I just referred to, to my country, I mean, Italy, that was heavily affected, especially in, in, at the outbreak of the, of the pandemic. And uh, dentistry wasn't really stopped. I mean, the emergency was still 
provided to, to patients, emergency treatment, and things that could not be procrastinated. And to give you an idea, we conducted a survey in the entire Italy that was uh, reported the data of nearly the, let's say, around the 10%, a little less of the entire dental population. And what we understood, which is crucial, is that thousands and thousands of dental treatments were given every week just to treat emergencies. So the dental community really supported the population throughout these dire times. And I have to say, this was done at their own risks because most of the dentists had no idea how to tackle this and surely the majority of the countries, there was no support from the government in terms, for example, of PPE and protection in general. Yeah. So um, let me pay the tribute, first of all, to the dental community that supported the population worldwide. I think this is very important. So we, what we try to do, we, we gather the information that we got from China, then we, we sort of mix them with, uh, with uh, good common sense and the knowledge that we had on virus in general. And this helped us to pen uh, what was the first recommendations, well, at least suggestions. Uh, recommendation is too strong. Let's say suggestions. To practice. And this is what we really published. Uh, at the beginning of March on, on JDR, on Journal Data Research, the sort of a sum of, for example, the suggestions that were circulating among uh, Italy. Shortly afterwards, a bunch of documents came out from each country, and, and especially from main institutions, Switzerland first, but then the States, uh, American Dental Association, then Europe. We, there was also even a Cochrane, actually, review on recommendation that uh, was, uh, were relieved, released in that period. And, but more or less, all the concepts were sort of converging on some specific points. And these were the points that we highlighted in the, in the EFP infographics. Right. And uh, when you think of your book, um, I assume that the infographic from EFP were just, uh, let's say, something really top line. But uh, and in, with your book, you basically go more in depth in uh, like how to control the aerosol and so on, at least from the evidence uh, that were already published? Well, you see, Marcia, the, 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 the infographics, I mean, the books are really, the infographics is the juice that comes out from the book. So right. really, in the infographic, what you have is, uh, is the end point, the end results of things that are discussed in the book. Right. Uh, um, but the point was to give something that could be spread around safely and that was extremely complex because you have to bear in mind that each country has its own regulation first of all uh, each country had its own vision according to the phase of pandemic because when this get got out uh, some countries were really poorly affected by covid so for them this could have been some sort of a redundant procedure so a bit too much so uh, it wasn't easy really to capture the things that could be shared among everybody. To do that, in fact, we established sort of a hierarchy of the strength uh, of suggestions. Well, of course, once again, these are just suggestions. These are not recommendations. And even talking about strength, it reminds too much of the strength of the recommendation. But let's say we wanted to highlight that some things are debated, other things are clear. For example, the usage of double gloves that have been suggested, which has, by the way, more a practical meaning more than a sort of a tool for safety because the virus, the virus doesn't jump to your neck to suck your blood. I mean, I think people need <laughs> yeah. So a one glove is more than enough, but to have double gloves may help when you are duffing because removing clothing is actually the tricky moment for, for doctors is when they get infected. Yes, yeah, true. I saw actually a couple of uh, tutorials in on YouTube somewhere actually addressed to uh, I mean, different type of healthcare professionals. They were actually showing how to uh, like take off uh, the the gun, the the Google, and so on. So I assume that of course every single moment can be extremely has to be treated with a certain protocol, and. Uh, um, I remember that about aerosol, uh, like there were no many references. So could you explain to us a little bit your experience and if you decided to do something around it? Well, 
aerosol, it's, it's a very interesting topic because on one hand, we have some literature coming from, at the best, 2004, 2005. The, the uh, literature on aerosol is mainly focusing on bacteria. The models of, that were used were mainly uh, sort of uh, having the dental chair in this uh, research uh, center with lots of wires and lots of thin stripes of paper where actually droplets could be captured. So it's a very, I would say, very, very basic research setting. So these are really the information that we had on, on aerosol in dentistry especially. Then of course we had lots of information on aerosol on virus, but surely we had nothing on, on coronavirus, very little things. So why aerosol was relevant? You might have noticed that at some stage, the New York Times get out with, with a graph stating that basically dentists are the professional at higher risk because they, we, not they, but we, we stay at a very short span, short distance to the patient, and the patient is, of course, with the mouth and the nose unprotected. Uh, but in reality, let me just add a point I think is crucial. If that would be true, the number of diseased, unfortunately, among colleagues would be very high. But in fact, it, is, it appears, and I'm sharing some confidential data from both Lombardia, which is the area around Milan, but even from China, it, it looks that actually the dental population was affected less than the general population, indicating most probably that even the basic usual uh, dental setting with masks, googles, and gloves would be more than enough to be protected, which is actually a good thing. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the the concept of trying to understand aerosol was crucial, and uh, but when I turned my back and tried to read previously to an aerosol, I couldn't really gather too much in the understanding of what should be done and what should not be done. Of course, we suggested to use you know uh, high speed suction to work at four hands, using rubber dam, try to use barrier. Years, you know, of course, we try to limit, but the concept of what should be done and what should not be done is actually very important. In light, especially, of what uh, periodontology does, in perio, we do produce an enormous amount of aerosol with both ultrasonics, air polishers, mainly perio, modern periodontology is very much about producing aerosol. So to do that, we, we, we changed the, the, the studies, uh, we changed a bit the literature by applying um, uh, the, 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 the name is a bit complex, is a, is a gravimeter impactor. Basically, it's a machine that allows us to measure the amount of uh, PM, so particulate matters, in the air. Going from PM10, so particulate of 10 micron, which is the one that are like dust, for example, that you know we tend to hear about a lot about this, down to 0 0.3 micron, which is really I, I couldn't even describe it. I mean, if, zero, if 10 p.m. is just one little dot on a human air, 0 0.3 is minuscule. Uh, it's just like having two or three virus together. That's it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And so we calculated what that happened, and we established various models. The first model was we did this with the ultrasonic instrumentation of patients, because these studies were done on real patients, not on phantom ants. So we calculated basically two hours after the treatment, what was the dynamic of each particles going from zero three to 10 micron. And what was interesting was to see that of course the 10 micron, five micron droplets, because these are really drops that are really big and heavy, they go down immediately as soon as you finish the treatment, which, is, which does make sense uh, because uh, they're heavy, so they would go down. But if you go and check particles that are very thin, like 0 0.3 and 0 0.5 micron, they actually afloat and stays around. This is a sort of a nebula. Reason being most probably that, of course, they enter a sort of a Brownian movement, where in fact the collision among particles maintain them in the air. I think this is very important because it was the first proof that sub-micron aerosol actually stays. Now, this was done with ultrasonic. Then we also compared manual and air polishers. Of course, manual instrumentation de determines a lower level of aerosols, but still determines some aerosols because 
just by moving arms and, and being there. There is some perturbation of the air quality. This is obvious and something that you cannot stop it. You have to live with that. But what is, was incredible was the use of air polisher. Of course, these are models that are made to determine air polishing. So these are not models yet to try to limit. Uh, so uh, we, we use air, air polisher to create as much as possible aerosols. So by using in the interior area without high power suction. But the level compared to ultrasonic was 10 times more the level of aerosols. But what is important, you have to bear in mind that when we make our instrumentation, for example, with air polishers or with uh, ultrasonics, but in a lower level, the nebula keeps staying for half an hour, which means that theoretically, when the next patient comes in, he enters or she enters a nebula of previous aerosols. Now, that could be a public health issue if there was any trace or any idea that actually the dental setting might have created some uh, variation of infection, but in fact, we know that it hasn't been the case. So it is really likely that in fact, we all live in nebulas, we all live in particulate matters, and we need to understand how to limit this, not just for the virus per se, because as I said, it feels and it looks from the preliminary data that the dental setting is extremely safe and dentists are actually safe even with the previous settings. Uh, but I think what is important is to understand that we need to clean better our air. We need to have sort of a better environment for many other reasons that we need to understand. And I think this should be the highest legacy that this COVID experience will leave to dentistry. As much as HIV changed dentistry for the better, I I really hope that COVID will do the same for moving for, to a blood-borne enemy to an airborne enemy. You know, um, actually, lately, uh, I've been hearing some, you know, ideas and stuff. There are, of course, ideas around the purifying the air, so something that can actually, you know, get the air in through a filter and get out with the purified air. But I was, um, and there was actually an engineer from Italy, Engineer Palazzetti, I think you know him from Fiat. He was the one that invented uh, the ABS system. Okay, oh, yeah. and, uh, and I hear that he got this intuition that maybe creating vortex that gets uh, whatever is within the aerosol produced by one person, get back to that person. I mean, that could be something interesting, but not applicable in a, in a clinic, for example. But I was wondering whether either you filter or you push them down. So having system that basically push down particles directly in order, let's say, between patients, for example, in order to somehow avoid to have this cloud up. Well, there are various tools to limit aerosol. First of all, remember, suction is crucial. So an eye power suction can limit enormously. I can even tell you, and this is the last phase of the trial that we started, which is the most important to understand how to limit, that for example, ultrasonic in the posterior area do not really produce such tremendous aerosols. That means that, that, the, that the cheeks and the tongue per se really represent a sort of important barrier. That's why I would say nowadays that with a good suction to use ultrasonics in the posterior area without really hesitation, uh, not at all. Um, what, what I think it's important is to uh, understand that you need to work out, you need to work really, that you need to try to limit aerosols by doing lots of suction and protection. And at the same time, you need to circulate the air to a point that you dilute the possible effect of the aerosol. That's why it is essential, for example, to open windows among patients, to facilitate ventilation. And of course, the filters that you are referring, I mean, I'm referring to the super EPA filters. This is the one that we are also testing now. They have the capability to change the setting of the air to, by circulating better air, by filtering it. Uh, and therefore, I think we should work on both filtration and aspiration and ventilation. These three topics, of course, all together with a better understanding of the techniques, should really limit dramatically the risk of any possible. Uh, professional disease. Actually, um, I, I will uh, um, ask you something that is uh, a player in our uh, in our chat. They are basically uh, asking about the heritage of uh, this uh, uh, COVID situation. What do you think will be the two things that uh, 
will be adopted stable, uh, stably in the future setting for the clinics? Well, I think when this entire uh, nightmare will be over for good, because of course now the outlook, the outlook is, much, is much brighter. So we all already tend to be a bit more relaxed compared, for example, to a month and a half ago when I was approaching every patient as sort of an Ebola patient. You know, now I have to say I'm getting much more relaxed. You know, if I consider my town Pisa, that is, you know, it's the most beautiful town. <laughs> The most beautiful town in Italy. <laughs> uh, the only beautiful town in Italy. Pisa, <laughs> especially. Uh, in, in the last month, we had in the entire province four, four cases. So you don't really have the feeling of something so dangerous as much as we had in May. So this also has an effect. But, but surely I would think that the control of uh, aerosol would be an important thing, especially indoor air quality. I mean, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, I mean, we understood that we've been working in nebulas of particulate for all our life. Yeah. I don't know if that has an impossible impact on health, but surely I want to have a cleaner and, and more purified air so I will work in the future. Secondly, I think we'll rely a lot more on face masks because we kind of get used to that and we realize how important it is to protect us. I mean, actually, if you do a proper instrumentation, like you know, preparing a central for a prosthodontics or making an air polisher, and you see the amount of droplets that you have on the shield, you really wonder what you've done in the past. I mean, we've been floating and, and swimming into uh, droplets. So I think these precautions uh, will actually be the heritage. I mean, we will look after the air quality more, but I don't think that we will stop using some instrument. I think we'll just find our own way to use exactly the instrument we used before by minimizing, of course, the aerosols. And of course, suction dumps, these are the stories. Another question that is coming from uh, uh, Dr. Sabai Kanchana, I hope uh, I pronounced the, uh, this name correctly, uh, is uh, that if you have, if you know any other tool beside our high power suction, uh, rubber dam, and uh, uh, filters, do you know if there is anything else? Well, I think the super EPA filters are the one that are the chance to collect at least the 99% of the particulate, irrespective of the dimension. So, and, and I have to say that uh, it is funny because I've been more relevant for some companies now talking about COVID than my entire life with periodontology. So now I've been approached by numerous companies. And I realized that there is a lot of things in the market. And, and I have to say, you know, I, I don't know any of those, but they all seem uh, an amount of money that a dental practice should be easily able to, to invest to, 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 to clean the air. So I would go for super EPA filters, no discussion. Okay, and uh, another one um, is asking about uh, air purifier together with UVC disinfection. Do you think that, that could have but any impact? Air purifier, yes. UV disinfection, not really, no. I mean, it's been hugely debated. UV uh, would just act where actually the, uh, the UV would, uh, would act. Uh, so that means that if there are some errors of shadows, that will not happen. Plus, of course, the UV is something to do at the end of the day. But for that, you just need a good hypochlorite or hydrogen peroxide to pass all over the surface. This is more than enough. Uh, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't exaggerate, to be honest. I think the usual procedure is clean everything with disinfectant, uh, enhanced ventilation, and possibly, of course, filtering air. It's, it's more than enough to maintain the, the atmosphere clean. Okay, I have actually a, a more uh, a question that arrived by talking with, uh, with my team two days ago about this topic, and you know the use of patient mask and so on in uh, um, liaising with the patient. I mean, we know that uh, often the outcome of a treatment uh, is uh, actually best when there is empathy between the professional and the patient. Do you think that uh, um, mask? and using all of those protect protection tools, besides the fact that the dentists always have used masks, for example, 
but do you think that those could somehow impact the outcome of uh, uh, the treatment? Or, I mean, there are solutions to avoid that uh, there are any difference in the outcome? Marcia, thank you for touching this. I think this is important. First of all, let me allow to say something. We are in a sort of emergency. Periodontitis is degenerating here. People have been locked in their house, have smoked more, have eaten more, and they've been incredibly stressed. The fear and, and the uncomfortable sensation of watching TV, listing the number of deaths every day, uh, the um, unexpected scenario that happened so swift and so fast changed dramatically our attitude. We know that social isolation and solitude bring you to a high level of inflammation. On the other hand, we have people that could not be treated. And I'm referring, for example, to periodontitis patients that are under supported treatment. So we couldn't really provide their support in terms of bacteria control. So you have more inflammation and more bacteria in subjects that maybe might even smoke more. So what I could notice in the last, I mean, I've been working till the 4th of May, so it's nearly two months. And the amount of deterioration that I've seen in my periodontitis patient is incredible. So there is really the call is among all colleagues to make sure that uh, both overall health, but especially oral health will be checked, not just teeth, but even gums and mucosas, because the effect of the lockdown actually are incredible. Having said that, Marcia, you know what I'm thinking, but, but I'm gonna share it again. Periodontology is not about a technique. Periodontology is not about how good you are with your hands, or periodontology is not about a teeth or a gum. Periodontology is about a persona, it's about a human being. So you can't be a good periodontist if you don't tango with the patient, if you don't establish a bond, a relationship. You can't really be a periodontist if you don't love people. So the way to do it now is that, of course, we are physically isolated because, you know, when the patient comes and dresses as sort of an onion, you know, I have all these layers and layers on top of it. But, but I can be physically isolated, but I don't want to be socially isolated. So in each patient, we actually have a simple WhatsApp call, you know, phase one, video WhatsApp call. You know, for the, for the more evolved one, I even have a, a Skype or a, a Zoom, but I have to say they're all happy with, with WhatsApp. And we talk five minutes. We talk among them. We talk you know, about what they did, the problems that they had, but all the entire story of the anamnesis, all the contact with the patient is done showing my face and seeing their face. The reaction, a smile, a joke, something humane. So that the moment that I'm gonna see them, I can still talk in, but they've seen a face underneath the face mask. I think this is crucial and I strongly recommend it to everybody. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Now, uh, we have still four minutes for questions, so I'm gonna just read quickly through the one that arrived. Um, there is one that uh, is talking about if you have advices also, I mean, beside the clinic, uh, for people working in open office, for example, uh, if you have advice on how to reduce uh, the, the, the amount of bacteria in the air and uh, protect our health. So this is, I assume, this is a bit of a general question on how to manage uh, aerosol if you can project in offices. Thank you, Marcia. I'll make it very simple. When I see on Facebook, you know, I'm of course very active on social media. Being a teenager like myself, it's, it's inevitable. But um, you see lots of lots of pictures of colleagues dressed as sort of a uh, Ebola virus clinic, you know, with all this kind of a scaffold on top, which I have to say, I find it a bit ridiculous because if they would tell me that they change it among each patient, then I would say they're doing a good thing. But I know every dentist and nobody could afford to change this among each patient, let alone the time spent in changing. So if you protect yourself this way, but then you're going to move from patient to another, you're potentially are the carrier of infection. Because you see, in, in a high V, in intensive care unit, people get changed at the beginning and the end of the shift, but they are among people that are all infected. So they're not spreading anything around. But when I see 20 patients, potentially, I could 
out of 21 could be infected and I could potentially be the carrier for the next one. That's why it's important to have something smart that you can move on and, on and off. I, uh, I use a, an FFP2 mask, but then I cover it with a surgical mask that I'm gonna change among each patient. Why? Well, because I can't afford to change an FFP2 among each single patient. Yeah. I so uh, I would use, I use this, I use Google, I use a face uh, shield, and then I use two layers, one a drop repellent, the other one not on top, that I, once again, I change among each patient, and I use double globin every time that I don't have to do things that are too fine. Reason being that when I remove things, I remove them with the lower uh, gloves, especially the trickiest piece is when you're removing things on your head. So always make sure that when you're removing the mask, you are not breathing and closing your, your, your eyes and take it out very far away and then remove it. Of course, you know, by holding from, from the top, from the later. It's the same with, with the glasses. Always close your eyes and don't breathe. This is the tricky moment when you're doffing the face structure. There is another interesting question about air conditioning, which I think is something that is, I mean, for everybody is a, is a question mark now. Is the, you know, air conditioning and therefore a cool, a cool air uh, helping the situation? Could that well, have been? Yeah, I mean, there is some debate. I can tell you that when we talk about air conditioning, in fact, we're talking about different things. That's why we wanted to now write a chapter on this because we realized that we, there is a need of clarifying. One story is the inner air system. Another story is to change the temperature of the air, such as, for example, making the air cooler during the summer and so forth. So ventilation or inner ventilation that is done with machine, for example, these are actually very good. The more you have it, the better because they take uh, airs from outside and they bring it in. So, for example, in my practice, we have an exchange, I think. I don't, I don't remember how many cubicle meters, but I think we change the entire room many times during, during each hour. So we, have, we kind of get new airs continuously. But at the same time, air condition is crucial. I mean, in, in Pisa today is 33 degrees and, and my clinic is actually just below the roof. Uh, the temperature could be unbearable without air conditioning. You can't even open the windows, in fact, among patients because that would be too much. So we surely use air conditioning. The suggestion is to take airs from outside. Sometimes in some split, you can choose not to use the recircle of the airs, but sometimes you cannot. In that case, try to clean the filters as much as you can. At, at the worst case scenario, once a week. But, 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 but it is safe. Everybody knows that it's impossible not to use them. And we will also need to adapt ourselves to, to human beingness. So uh, I think we're going to have this last question, which I think is quite interesting, uh, which is about um, telemedicine slash teledentistry. Uh, with this new norm, what do you think would be the space for this type of tool? Well, I, I believe it is uh, crucial. There is lots of uh, materials available for ortho. Um, ortho he has already some apps that are very interesting that I've been evaluating actually for more than a year. However, ortho is relying on, on, on teeth movement. So if I, from, let's say from the buccal side, I see something that is working or moving this way, I can also imagine what is happening in behind. But for the gum, this, for example, doesn't work, which means that I could, in the best case scenario, having a patient that is capable to capture some images on the, uh, on the buccal side, but I would know nothing on the palatal side. So I think that's, for me as a prodontist, is one of the trickiest bits, especially the, the back area and the inner side, the lower, the lingual and the palatal side. But I think surely it will be improved in terms of diagnosis, no discussion. But dentistry is something about using your hands. So at the end, I see it, for example, for alineators, for ortho, I'm sure that teledentistry will improve, but it will be telediagnostics. It will not be teledentistry. I see. Yeah, it makes absolutely sense. So thank you so much for this uh, nice conversation. Thanks for being our first guest uh, in the Sunstar Conversation series. I would like to thank everybody that participated today and um, I would like to wish all of you a nice day and uh, we will be here soon. Uh, and uh, so see you soon. Thanks. Thank you.
Thank you. It's been a honor to be here. And if there are questions that haven't been replied, just write me on Instagram and I'll do my best. Absolutely. We will. And we will try also to track all the nice questions that were written and see whether we can post the answers in our different channels. We are present, in, of course, in uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube and Instagram as well. So we will actually be mentioning yourself probably quite a lot and seek your advice. And um, thanks so much. Thank you. Ciao. Bye.